Hi, thank you, Dr. Shikande, for introducing me. Um, as she mentioned, I am in the Alfred lab. And today I'm going to be talking to you guys about the importance of cilia, um, Chlamydomonas green algae as a model organism, and this FAT93 protein and its length dependency. So some of you guys might be familiar with cilia, um, most commonly in sperm. So the sperm tail, you might have heard it referred to as a flagella. I'm gonna use flagella and cilia interchangeably in this talk. So these sperm tails, these cilia are used to move the sperm to the egg for fertilization. Conversely, we also have cilia in the egg donor in the fallopian tubes, moving that egg from the fallopian tubes down into the uterus to allow for fertilization. In another location in the body, in the brain, we have cilia in the brain ventricles. This allows for cerebral spinal fluid to um, flow naturally in our brain. As well as in our airways, we have cilia that move the debris from our upper respiratory tract so that we don't have infection or things like that. So I hope that I've convinced you that these are found everywhere in the body, so they're super important. So understandably, defects in these cilia are going to cause some really serious issues. So looking in more specifically the reproductive system and more specifically the sperm donor, if the sperm donor has defects in the cilia, that sperm is not going to be modal enough to fertilize the egg. You're not ever going to get fertilization there. Conversely, in the egg donor, if you have defects in the cilia in the fallopian tubes, that egg is never going to make it to the uterus. And again, you're not going to get fertilization. So again, you have this this infertility issue um, that many people struggle with today, and that's because of cilia, or partially because of cilia. And in another system, the respiratory system, some of you guys might be familiar with um, cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is characterized by chronic respiratory infections. Cystic fibrosis isn't necessarily caused by defects in the cilia. However, in the respiratory system, defects in the cilia can cause cystic fibrosis-like sy symptoms. So because that debris is not being cleared from your upper respiratory tract because the cilia are no longer motile, you can have chronic respiratory infections ca caused as a result. So now I've talked to you guys about cilia, right? What, what does the structure look like? So over here on the left, we have um, a cell wall right here, and we have the cilium, that's the singular of cilia, extruding out from the cell membrane. And if we take the cilia and we chop it in half, we get what we call a cross section. And so that's shown, that's shown here. I'm gonna use this image right here because it's a little bit clearer. And so this is a highly complex and evolutionarily conserved structure. It's highly ordered. It has over 600 different proteins all along the length. And we call the core the axoneme. So that's going to be all of these proteins and shapes in here, except for this black outer membrane. So this is called the axoneme. And then within that, we have what we call the nine plus two. That's from these green microtubules. You can see they're paired in doublets on the outside. There are nine doublets on the outside with two singlets on the inside, so nine plus two. We also have some outer dynein arms in orange and then gray inner dynein arms. And those are going to be our molecular motors that help for uh, movement of the cilia. And so we can analogize this to the structure of a cucumber. As you chop the cucumber down and you slice it, you're going to have the same structure. It's the same way in the cilium. As you take these slices, these cross sections, up the cilium, this is what it generally will look like. You'll have this nine plus two axoneme all throughout. Likewise, we can take longitudinal uh, slices, going back to the structure of our cucumber, and it looks the same throughout. We see this in the cilium as well with this 96 nanometer repeat. 
So every 96 nanometers, we have four outer dining arms in orange, and we have seven inner dining arms in gray, and it repeats every 96 nanometers. And as I mentioned before, this structure is very conserved. So we have Darwin here, our uh, father of evolution. We have a, uh, a tree with Homo sapiens, humans, and Chlamydomonas reinhardi in algae. As you can tell, we are not very closely related to algae. However, if you take the sperm flagella and the clammy cilia, and you take that cross section, you see this very similar nine plus two structure. And so because of that, we can actually use Chlamydomonas as a model system as a model organism to study cilia. So a little bit about Clammy. We nickname him Clammy because Chlamydomonas reinhardi is a little bit of a mouthful to say. Um, it's a green algae, has two cilia as opposed to the one that sperm has, and it's super lab friendly. It's unicellular, so we don't have to worry about any other factors that multicellularity might bring in. It's eukaryotic, just like humans. So again, another good selling point. It's very easy to grow and it's also haploid. So to understand why that helps us, I'm gonna show you what it is in humans. So humans, we are diploid. So that means that we have two copies of a, of a gene per cell. And so you have one from the egg donor and one from the sperm donor. And so understandably, when you have a mutation, you might only affect one of those genes you still have that other gene. So you might or might not see a phenotype from that mutation. You can, uh, an example of this is sickle cells. So you might, you might have heard being a carrier for sickle cell disease. You don't necessarily show the phenotype of sickle cell. However, you can pass that along to your children. So you do have this mutated gene, but you're not expressing any kind of phenotype. However, clammy, they're haploid. So they only have one copy of each gene. So if you induce a mutation, you're going to see a mutant phenotype. And so this makes it very easy for us to manipulate uh, this model organism to fit what we need to study. We don't have to worry about rescue of the phenotype from this good gene because there is no other good gene in clammy. So, we're looking at clammy. The Alfred lab is specifically looking at this protein called FAT93. Now, I'm not going to go too into depth about how we isolated FAT93, um, but I can after this talk. The main thing I want you all to focus on is FAT93 and length. So up here in the top right, we have uh, immunofluorescence. I'll go into that a little bit later. But in green, we have FAT93, and we've found that it's been localized to the base of the axonine. The, ax the, the cilia is shown in red right here. And what I'm more specifically looking at is whether or not there's variation in the length of this protein. My hypothesis is that as this length in red of the cilia increases, so will this green FAT93 domain length. And the way that I'm going to do that is use these length mutants. As I mentioned before, they're haploids, so they're very easy to induce these mutations in. And so we have some long flagellar mutants that have longer uh, cilia than our wild type or normal length cilia do. And I'm going to analyze this length by immunofluorescence. So you might be wondering, what is immunofluorescence? Uh, so it's a pretty big word. We can break it down into two different parts, immuno and fluorescence. So looking at that immuno, you might think immune response, immune system, you're exactly correct. Um, your body automatically makes these antibodies in response to foreign entities in your body, foreign proteins, things like that. And what it does is it'll make antibodies that are very specific to a protein. And they have this binding site that's specific to each protein. So for example, COVID-19, right, being relevant today, if you get infected with COVID-19, you, your body will make antibodies against the spike protein. It's very specific. It's not going to fight off 
um, a flu virus. It's not going to fight off any other kind of protein except for that COVID-19 virus. And so we can utilize this system and make an antibody that will only bind to FAT93. And we can also add this colored tag onto it. That's where the fluorescence comes in. This colored tag, when you hit it with a certain light, will emit a certain color. And that's shown right here. So in green, sorry, in green we have FAT93 and the red is showing the cilia. And what I then do is measure these lengths of the FAT93 domain as well as the ciliary length. And I'm going to do this in both our wild type or normal length cilia and our long flagellar mutants as well. The rationale behind this is that length is very precisely controlled. It's about 10 and a half microns on average, and we don't see very much variation in that. And so ultimately what I'm asking is whether or not FAT93 is dependent on the length of the cilia. In other words, is it under the same control as the regulators for flagellar length. Over on the right, I have some nice immunofluorescence images of our wild type or CC125 cells and our long flagellar mutants. As you can see, they are characterized by this much longer flagellar length than these cells right here. And what we find is that FAT93 length actually is significantly different in these longer flagellar mutants. On the x-axis, we have our cell type, our CC125 or wild type, and our long flagellar 4-9 mutant. On the y-axis, we have length in microns, so this is on a very small scale. In our white boxes, we have flagellar length, and our black boxes are FAT93 domain length. This is indicating significance. And we see, we go from 10.47, this is again, very close to that 10.5 on average microns of flagellar length in our wild type, up to 28.92 um, microns in our long flagellar mutants. Conversely, in FAT93, we go from 1.36 microns to about 2.20 microns in our long flagellar mutants. And these two, um, values are significantly different from each other when studied by a two-sided t-test. And there's an interesting phenotype that also emerged while I was doing this research. It turns out that these long flagellar mutants, and this is something that we only see in long flagellar mutants, we're not seeing this in wild type, is this punctuated or diffused region of this FAT93 domain. So you see it ends up being dense, over here and it kind of tapers off as we get to the end of that domain. So when I quantified this, what I found was that the I measured the dense region and then I measured this combined region of the dense and the tapered off. And I compared those to our wild type cells and I found that they were all significantly different from each other. So this can end up being a future research question asking why there is this tapered portion of the FAT93, like why this diffuse staining is there. So in summary, um, I hope I've convinced you that cilia are incredibly important and defects in them can be um, fairly serious and that we can study these, this structure as in, a, in the model organism Chlamydomonas, this green algae. Furthermore, we found that FAT93 is length dependent, indicating that it could be under the same control as the regulators of flagellar length, and that future research can also address this tapered off or diffused end of the FAT93 domain. So I'd like to uh, take a moment and thank my thesis chair, Dr. Alford, my, the members of my committee, Dr. Walden, Dr. Wong, Dr. Schmeichel, and then finally my lab mate, Reagan Goodwin, without which I could not have done this research. So thank you.